1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 31. This is God's word. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. But if the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts we are, are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the higher gifts. And I will show you a still more excellent way. Thank you. You may be seated. Join me in a brief word of prayer. Lord, as we now enter into this moment in our gathering where we have the distinct privilege of looking at your word and hearing your word being spoken over us, I pray that we would not waste this time. I pray that this next 40 minutes or so together would be so helpful and rich to us, Lord, not because preaching is happening, but because God is speaking to us through his word. I thank you, though, that you do use the foolishness of preaching to help us to see who Christ is, that we might know Jesus better. I pray that that would be the effect of this time together. Help me, your messenger, and all those who listen today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As I said, we continue this morning our mini-series on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But I'd like to begin today by talking about light. Scientifically speaking, light is an absolutely amazing form of energy. Light can either be hot or cool. It can be bright or dim. Light has the, the power to illumine places where darkness thinks it's in control. And light comes in many forms. Take, for example, the contrast or the difference between a spotlight and a laser beam. These are both forms of light, although they're very, very different forms of light, aren't they? So how can a medium power uh, spotlight, uh, excuse me, laser beam, burn through steel in a matter of seconds, whereas the most powerful spotlight can only make it warm? What's the difference between those two kinds of light? The difference is unity. Now, a laser can be described simply as a, a medium of excited molecules with mirrors at each end. At one end, some of the excited molecules release a photon, a, a particle of light. And here, the process of the laser begins. 
That photon moves along, and then what it does is it, it tickles another molecule, inviting another photon to join in on the journey. These two photons then tickle two more molecules, and two more photons join the parade. So what happens is, is there's a huge army of photons marching in unison. And it's this unity, friends, that gives the laser its power. Now, a spotlight may have just as many photons, but in the spotlight, they're all going their own independent way, each occasionally interfering with the other photons. And because of this, much of a spotlight's power is wasted and can't be focused to do a similar work. But the laser, because of its unity, is like an army marching in tight formation and is able to focus all of its power on the objective. You see, a laser's unity turns its diversity into power. Now, friends, that's true of light. But it's also true of the local church. The more unified a church's members are, the more laser-like a church's members are, the more powerful it will be to accomplish the objective that God has assigned to it. Now, the church in Corinth looked obviously more like a spotlight in its life together than a laser. Indeed, there were many in the church, supposedly, who wanted the spotlight on them. And each member was going his or her own independent way, interfering with one another, bumping into one another, bumping heads, not walking in unison. So whatever power it has or had was wasted. Well, Paul, ever the pastor, sees this. And here in chapters 12 and 13, Paul is really going to get in here deep. And he's, he's going to describe the purpose for which Christ has given gifts to his church, spiritual gifts to the local church. And that purpose is unity, brotherly love. And guys, a church like that can absolutely change a neighborhood. It can change a city. It can change a country. It can change the world. Loved ones, these, are, these chapters in our Bible are here not mainly to tell us how to use the gifts that God has given to us. They're here because God in his wisdom knew that even the most godly Christians are prone to be independent floaters in the local church, tempted to do our own thing, focusing on me and not our objective. Friends, forgetting that we are an outpost of the kingdom of God in Wilmington, and we are here for a, the singular purpose of making much of Jesus as we gather in community and as we love on our neighbors in this city to the end that we, as we gather, and as we love our neighbors, we'll see that Jesus Christ is glorious. Now, I see, I see God making us as a church laser-like in our mission, laser-like in our objective. There are many gifts operating in this church. But friends, let's not let these chapters pass us by without them actually changing us. If, if we, by the Spirit, will know and learn what it means, what Paul means to walk in unison, then our unity will turn our diversity into power. The title of this sermon, if you're taking notes, I'm taking my cue here from verse 20, is One Glorious Body, Many Vital Parts. One Glorious Body, Many Vital Parts. I want to look at this under three headings today. Again, if you're taking notes, I'll give these each to you, then we'll go through each of them. The first is the body as one people, verses 12 to 13. The second are the body's parts, verses 14 to 21. And third is the body's purpose. We'll close out the chapter with that. So are you ready? If you're with me, say amen. All right, good. The body is one people, number one, verses 12 to 13. Our text begins today in verse 12 with the word for, for. This is a conjunction. It's a connecting word. 
what, what Paul is doing is he's connecting what he's now going to say in these next verses, 12 and following, with what he just said in verses 4 through 11. We looked at this last week about the, the Holy Spirit's distribution of charisma. We, so that's a Greek word for spiritual gifts. And the Holy Spirit gives spiritual gifts to the church, we saw last week, for the common good. Here, Paul explicitly states in this section, of course it's by way of metaphor, that the Christians in Corinth, each having their own charisma, are a part of something bigger than just them independently. They're a part of a single organism, a, a single entity that Paul refers to as the body of Christ. So in other words, just as the human body is a, a single organism made up of many cells and organs and limbs, yet it remains a unity, the same is true of Christ. And very quickly we begin to see, it becomes apparent that Paul is using this term body of Christ in the passage, but he's not referring to the physical body of Christ in heaven. He's talking about the church. Now here in verse 12, the, the word body has sort of a, or church has a broader sort of universal connotation, but I think as the passage goes on, it becomes clear that Paul is talking about this particular local church in Corinth, and of course, by extension, all of us. Now, to explain how the, the church came to be a single unity of diverse members, in verse 13, Paul uses this baptism imagery, interesting, to help his Corinthian readers understand who they are, to help them see who, what their identity is. Now, there's no shortage of debate as to if Paul is referring here to a sort of baptism of the Holy Spirit, and if he is, whether this experience occurs at conversion or if it's an experience that follows our conversion. And oftentimes, this passage is called upon by either side to build their case on baptism of the Holy Spirit. But honestly, the ESV has done a really good job of translating here Paul's intention in the original language. And at least to me, it's pretty clear what Paul's saying here. This first part of verse 13 in the original reads literally, For in one spirit, in one body, we were all baptized. Paul uses this term baptism not necessarily to refer to some later experience of the spirit after conversion, not necessarily to refer to water baptism as he did in chapter 10, but he uses it to show that when these Corinthian people believed in the gospel, Jesus Christ immersed them in the Spirit. That word drink even has a connotation of drenching them, thereby making them a part of his body. And just in case there's any confusion as to who Paul is talking about, three times in two verses, Paul uses the word all. He said, we were all baptized. And just in case there's any confusion, he says, let me give you the two groups of people, the two categories of people that separated the tiers of people, the categories of people in Corinth. People in Corinth were separated either by race or by social class. But Paul says, no, listen to me. Whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, whether you are a slave or free, you are one in Christ. We have all received, we have all drank from the Spirit. What's the point? The point is, is that every Christian, every Christian has received free, unhindered access to the Holy Spirit by virtue of our belonging to the body of Christ. Friends, that means there's no hierarchy in the church. There is no tiered Christianity. And when it comes to spiritual gifting, listen, that means there's no hierarchy there either. Yes, there's spiritual authority. All Christians in every age are under the spiritual authority of the, the apostles who inscripturated the inspired, infallible word of God. All Christians in a local church are under the spiritual authority of its pastoral leadership. But the one essential thing that makes Christians differ from each other, according to Paul, is that we've each simply been given a different role to play as an organ or a limb 
and the spiritual body of Christ on the earth, who has, by Christ, enabled us, enabled us to drink of the Holy Spirit. Friends, if you're a Christian here today, what you are or what you were and what you are by birth or by lineage or heritage or by life circumstance, listen, that no longer has bearing on your value as a human being. Our culture says it does. Our culture says that your essential self, who you are and your race and your social status, your heritage, the things that you do, that's where you get your value from. Paul says your significance is tied to the body, capital B, body that you belong to. Now the, the distinctions that make us unique, those things, guys, those aren't lost. Those aren't swallowed up when we become believers, when we're baptized into his body. We're still the same essential person. But when we become a Christian, those identity markers lose their voice to speak to our value or our worth. David Garland, the commentator in uh, the Baker Exegetical Commentary of the New Testament, elaborates this for us when he says, Paul affirms that in Christ and only in Christ are ethnic and sociological differences negated. What may polarize the world does not or should not divide the church. The segmentation of the Corinthian congregation into cliques is the byproduct of human depravity, sin, that spurs individuals to treat their differing spiritual experiences as a pretext for employing spiritual classifications so as to elevate themselves over others. You know, in my experience, I think that one of the greatest hindrances to unity, to fellowship, to walking together in a local church is not primarily social or racial factors. One of the greatest evidences I've seen of disunity comes from doctrinal disagreement. How we each interpret and apply the scriptures. Disagreements over belief and practice too often do bad things in a local church. Too often they lead to coldness and formality where there should be warmth. To suspicion where there should be love between brothers and sisters. Now, don't misunderstand me. In a local church, there's going to be some level of agreement between the members of that local church. We're all under a statement of faith. We all at least, in principle, ascend to that statement of faith. We're not saying there shouldn't be some mutual agreement on things. But I've seen that it's the secondary or even the tertiary matters where Satan creeps in and loves to get a foothold in the local church. Friends, if, if we're going to be laser-like in our mission as a body, and there's something that we need to learn from these passages by way of application, we need to learn that we don't have, friends, a monopoly on the truth. I know we stand on a statement of faith that I would, I would die to defend at this point in my life at least. We have a robust set of doctrines that we live by, and we ought to. We ought to do our best to divide God's word and understand what it has to say. But let us never be people who look down on others that don't agree 100% with my own belief system or structure. I don't have a monopoly on truth. You don't have a monopoly on truth. We don't have a monopoly on the Holy Spirit. Every one of us in this room has drank of the Holy Spirit. If we are believers and our differences in the sight of God together, friends, are beautiful. And together they show the multifaceted wisdom of God. Remember what Paul said in chapter 3? He said, all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas. These are the guys they were gathering around and saying, this is my guy. Paul says, you got it all wrong. All things are yours. This preacher and that preacher. Rather than stand in, in quiet judgment over someone who listens to that podcast or that preacher or shares something in our missional community group that you disagree with, friends, we ought to rejoice that we don't belong to a bland, 
boring, single orientation body, a shapeless church, but that God loved us so much that he put us here to learn from those who differ. Unity isn't uniformity. Unity embraces what is different and power is the result. This is what Paul's getting at in the second point here, the body's parts. The body's parts, verses 14 to 21. Paul now moves from the general to the specific while maintaining this use of the body metaphor. And he addresses sort of maybe what we might call two different kinds of groups of people in the church in Corinth. Uh, you had one group over here. I don't want to do that because you'll think I'm pointing at you. You had one group over here that had this sort of pronounced spiritual gifts. This is the one group. And then you had this other group over here that maybe had more muted or less distinct spiritual gifts, but they were still a part of the body by virtue of their faith in Jesus. In our modern terms, we might say, uh, this is the charismatics over here, and, and this is the non-charismatics over here. Hopefully that term doesn't tempt you at all, but you understand what I'm trying to say. So the first group he addresses are the non-charismatics, verses 14 to 18. These, these are the ones in the Corinthian church who, who perhaps felt uh, like they were unworthy or inferior because of what they deemed was a lack of spiritual gifting. As they evaluated themselves, this group concluded, I don't really have a whole lot to offer the Lord or this body. And so Paul gets real kind of funny here in verse 14, and he starts talking about different parts of the body. And he says that the body is, in its essential nature, a unity of diversity by God's design. In other words, even though the body is one, the church is one, it has many different complementary parts. And then Paul begins to identify some of the parts of the body in order to encourage these poor non-charismatics uh, over and against the more charismatics in the group. He says in verse uh, 16, for example, and if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? And if the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? So here's what he says to Mr. Ear. This, no, this is what Mr. Ear is saying. Mr. Ear is stepping back, and he goes, oh, there's the eye. That eye can do so many things. That, that eye can recognize everyone from a mile away. It can spot friend or foe. It sees things in beautiful co color. It can read words. But I can't do that. I don't belong here. That's the conclusion that he makes. So Paul responds, and he says, Mr. Ear, just because an eye and an ear are functionally different, it does not mean that you are somehow inferior to the eye, nor are you any less a part of the body. In fact, the eye needs you. The eye can't hear the beauty of a symphony with all those instruments it sees playing. It can't hear the beauty of a symphony without you. It can't identify falsehood and false preaching and false teachers unless you are listening. Now, we could take that meta metaphor too far, but you get the point. Some in the church in Corinth had concluded this church would be better off without me. And they arrived at this conclusion because they were comparing the perceived value of their spiritual gifts with that of others in the body. And to make matters worse, you had the charismatics who happily agreed with them. Because of the, the prominence or notable nature of their gift, maybe they had the, the gift of teaching or the gift of prophecy, the more visible public gifts, they were looking down on the non-charismatics, those per, perhaps had the gift of helping or administration, saying, verse 21, I, I, I have no need of you. So we see the picture. Here's this one group that finds themselves lacking, another group that finds themselves superior. And as a result, what happens? The body is divided. And in a, in a divided body, like photons in a spotlight, each is going their own independent way. Instead of working together, they're working against each other. And the result is what? They're powerless. 
They're not a city on a hill. They're nothing more than a lamp under a basket. You know, it's interesting as I study this passage, this church did not have a spiritual gift problem. They were operating in the full range of the spiritual gifts. Paul starts the book, starts the letter that way. I thank God that you're rich in all these wonderful gifts. He thanked God for that. But they did have another problem. They had a comparison problem. Now, friends, don't misunderstand. Comparison can be a really good thing. If I recognize, for example, that I am not spiritually gifted in the same way that my brother or my sister is, I am more likely to use in this time on earth my spiritual bandwidth wisely by not pursuing areas of ministry that God has probably not called me to. Healthy self-awareness can strengthen a local church. But unhealthy comparison is dangerous in a local church. It can lead to bitterness. It can lead to grudge holding. Again, it can lead to suspicion. And overall, just a, a general struggle walking in the good works that God has prepared for that individual member beforehand. I can remember our friend Jordan Spillers, Melita's son, is in the pastor's college right now, and I remember when Aaron and myself were there, and I came into the pastor's college not realizing how proud and arrogant I really was and how highly I thought of myself. And the very first day of class, I realized something. I realized that I was not as smart or as theologically astute as the other guys in my class. A good bulk of them. That sounds bad. Let's just say all of them. And I see this now, but having that mindset, that mentality, kept me at a distance from those brothers. So right from the first day, not only, not only was my workload hard, my heart load was hard. Maybe some of you can relate as you evaluate others in your peer groups, as you, as you look at others in your missional community. So friends, what's the answer then? Well, Paul tells us what the answer is. The answer is grace. Look at verse 18. But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. What's that say? It says that gifting, spiritual gifting, is not a man-made construct. Spiritual gifts are given not even as a result of one's merit or one's worthiness to receive them. Spiritual gifts are an act of God's mysterious, sovereign grace. And I'm sorry to tell you, it took me an entire year at the pastor's college to learn this. I remember on the very last day of class, I was apology, apologizing to some of my brothers in the class for how proud, proud I had been that year. Dear ones, listen, Paul says to us, learn, learn. Learn to see that usefulness in the body of Christ is a function of divine arrangement. Listen, each of us have been called to different life ex experiences and, and circumstances. And guess what? Your gifting is tied to that calling by God's design. But listen, he's the craftsman at the table. He's the one shaping. He's the one sanding. He is the one finishing. Friends, rather than us looking at one another and saying, why am I not like him or why am I not like her, we must remind ourselves that I am not called to his or her life and I'm not called to minister in exactly the same way they are. Instead, the implication of this is that we learn to appreciate, no, celebrate the charisma that's at work in others. God has done all the arranging. God has placed them here with us now to show us the beauty of a diverse church. Friends, only grace, not our lack, causes us to differ. Because in the end, the charisma, the grace gifts that God has given to his local churches are for a purpose. 
And that's how Paul will finish up this passage. Look at number three, the body's purpose. So all this unhealthy comparison is harmful, Paul says. But then he surprises us in verse 22 and following. And he says, actually, on the contrary, it's the weaker parts of the body, the parts that we consider to be less important, that are actually the most important in God's estimation. I love the way Eugene Peterson in the message paraphrases verses 22 to 24. He says, as a matter of fact, in practice, it works the other way. The lower part, the more basic, and therefore necessary. You can live without an eye, for instance, but not without a stomach. When it's a part of your own body you are concerned with, it makes no difference whether the part is visible or clothed, higher or lower. You give it dignity and honor just as it is without comparisons. If anything, you have more concern for the lower parts than the higher. If you had to choose, wouldn't you prefer good digestion to full-bodied hair? So he keeps the metaphor going. And he says that in Corinth, there were heads and stomachs. But you know, in the original, it's, there's really good evidence to show that that phrase, less honorable parts, is a reference to the parts of the body that we always cover, the sexual organs, for example. So Paul's really getting his use out of this metaphor. But do, do, you, see, do you see what he's getting at? Friends, there are parts of our bodies that we don't put on display publicly, but that does not mean that they're worthless. A stomach enables life to continue. Sexual organs do the same by reproducing and bringing new life into the world by God's design. And actually, the very fact that these parts are covered with, with skin and with clothing proves that we actually honor those parts. We're honoring them by covering them. We don't flaunt them. We, we don't expose them. We respect them. In a similar way, in every local church, in every, every local outpost of the kingdom of God, God has placed members that, quite frankly, aren't very attractive to the broader culture. They're not presentable. They don't have the beauty and the, the skill or the abilities that our culture uses to assign value or popularity. But Paul says that's okay. Because in chapter 1, God loves to choose what is weak in the world to shame those who think they are strong. He loves to choose what's low and despised to humble the popular. These precious folks in this church who some would say have very muted, very unpronounced spiritual gifts have been sent actually by God to a local church because God knows that in that church there are people who can only really be cared for by them. My care will often end when I step down from this pulpit. I'm not able as a pastor, which is a gift, to care for every member in the same way. But maybe you are able to do that in ways I cannot. And you're not standing up here on Sunday. Look at that. More important in the sight of God than someone who stands up here on a Sunday. And Paul says in verse 24, he says, but God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it so that the members may have the same care for each other. If one suffers, we all suffer. If one rejoices, we all rejoice. Anthony Thistleton, in his shorter commentary on the first, on first Corinthians, says this, the application to Corinth and to church life today is clear those who may appear to flaunt supposedly more spectacular gifts may turn out to be less indispensable than the faithful, humble, hard-praying, or hard-working members whose value may be overlooked by the power seekers. Christian believers who bring with them disabilities, privations, or experiences of suffering may be the most valuable, most precious, in charismatic part of the body because every church stands in genuine need of such to live out 
and to teach the character of the gospel. What's the purpose of God raising up and joining together a wonderfully diverse local church? You know what that purpose is? It's to display the glory of Jesus and what he's done for us in vibrant, brilliant color. Out in the world, people might have compassion toward the weak, and surely God uses the compassion of unbelievers to temporarily alleviate suffering. But listen, only in the church do people suffer together in the truest sense. This is only because only in the church its members are bound together by the head who is Christ. So when one limb or one organ of Christ's body hurts, listen, the whole body knows about it. The whole body feels it and the whole body responds. One commentator says, there are no private sufferings in the body of Christ. It's like the time when you were so dumb that you stepped off a curb and fractured your foot. And that thing swelled up and it hurt so bad. And you tried to go to sleep that night but the rest of the body, because it wanted to keep that foot company, stayed up with it all night long <laughs> to let it know, I'm here for you. I'm here for you. Dear ones, this kind of care is attractive to a world in darkness looking for light. Paul was able to gush over this messed up church in chapter 1 because he saw these gifts operating in this body, and he saw that this was a testimony of Christ among them. Even in Corinth, even in messed up Corinth, the glory of God shone, and the, lo the lost were drawn in. Friends, what a source of comfort and encouragement that is for us here to think that here in this body, there is everything that this church needs to be the outpost that God has called us to be. We're not lacking. We're not lacking in any good thing, he says. That's why Paul can ask without hesitation in verses 29 to 30 these rhetorical questions about the different types of gifts that God has given to the church. Let's read that one more time. He says, And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you still a more excellent way. That first, second, third language, I think, is Paul's way of saying, hey guys, this is the, this is the historical order of the gifts, the offices that God appointed for the church when Jesus ascended and the Holy Spirit fell on the church. But Paul's main point here is to show how rich and how varied the gifts are. The original wording is, is more stark. It says, it says, not all are apostles, are they? That's what it says in the original in the Greek. Not all work miracles, do they? Not all speak with tongues, do they? No is the expected response, but each have their part to play. And I think Paul tells them to earnestly desire to be zealous for the higher gifts. That is, the ones that will best serve to build up the body. Why? Because the well-being of the local body is of greatest importance to the Father and the Son that he gave. Our statement of faith for Sovereign Grace Churches carries, cap captures this beautifully in its section on the gifts of the Spirit. I want to read it for you. Christ loves his church, his body, and provides for its health and growth through the Holy Spirit. In addition to giving new life, the Spirit sovereignly bestows gifts on every believer. Spiritual gifts are those abilities and expressions of God's power given by his grace for the glory of Christ and the building up of the church. 
the variety of these gifts, some permanent and some occasional, some more natural and some more remarkable, reflects the diversity of the members of Christ's body and demonstrates our need for one another. Friends, don't you want to see that? When this happens in a local church, the cross that saves us will cease merely to be a creed or a belief statement. That cross will come into view. It'll be something that can be seen, that can be touched, and it will be a cause for awe and for worship, just as clearly as the Lord's Supper conveys the love of Jesus for sinners like the, us. Friends, the local church is a living sacrament. If you're a Christian, you are a picture of the Savior to a lost world. Don't ever let anyone, don't let yourself, don't let the devil tell you that you have nothing to offer a local church that you're a part of, namely Grace City Church. We're a glorious church, not, not because we have gifts, but because Jesus himself died and rose again to make us glorious, to make us his own. And he's equipped us with exactly what we need to show forth his glory to a watching world. Before we receive the Lord's Supper, I just want to stress this point one more time. This means that none of us in this room can say, I don't need you. And it means that none of us in this room can say, you don't need me. The Lord's will is that there be no independent spotlights at Grace City Church. Now, Paul's going to tell us about a more excellent way that never fails, and we're going to look at that next week. But as we receive the Lord's Supper, let, let, let's do something together. Would you... Would you do this with me? Let's, let's celebrate, as we see people gathering around these tables, let's celebrate the diversity that God has given to us in the gifts. Celebrate the people that we gather around the table with. And as we see and as we taste the, the broken bread, which is broken, the God, Christ's body broken for us, as we think of his suffering, let's ask the Lord, Lord, how does your suffering Enable me to suffer better with my hurting brothers and my hurting sisters. So on that note, Pastor Aaron, would you please come and distribute this meal for us today?